Welcome to the Wealth Uncensored podcast, straight talk about everything that impacts your wealth. In each episode, I share what I've learned through my own experience and two decades of helping high net worth clients structure their affairs to minimize taxes and protect their assets for the next generation. I'll also feature special guests who are experts in their own field, sharing their knowledge and experience to help you protect what's yours. I'm your host, Jimmy Sexton. Let's dive into today's show. Welcome to our latest episode, Crafting the Ideal Board for Your Private Trust Company or Family Foundation. I'm your host, Jimmy Sexton. In this episode, I'm going to be discussing how to structure the board of your private trust company or family foundation. I'm going to be talking about board composition, for example. Who's going to serve on the board? Will it consist of only family members or family members and trusted advisors? Will any friends serve? Or will it be a combination of those? Will there be any professional directors with trust or foundation experience that serve? While many clients don't like the idea of outsiders on their board, I generally recommend having a professional with trust or foundation experience on the board to ensure proper administration and corporate governance. I'm also going to be talking about setting criteria that prospective board members must fulfill in order to be able to serve. So let's get into board composition. Many people want to retain maximum control. So they choose a board that consists of themselves and a few trusted family members and or advisors. I generally think that this is a mistake. For one, having so much control could reduce the asset protection and tax benefits provided by your structure because creditors and tax authorities may consider the assets to still be yours due to your unfettered control. Second, just like with any business, you want a strong board. When it comes to a private trust company or a family foundation, that means having family members to represent the interests of different parts of the family, trusted advisors to advise on investment, business strategy, tax, and trust and foundation professionals to ensure that your structure is properly administered. So what are some of the criteria that you might want to set for prospective board members? So once you've decided on the board composition, you need to decide who's eligible to serve. Here's some requirements that I think you should consider that we use a lot in structuring boards for my clients of their uh, private trust companies and family foundations. So one is an age requirement. Setting a minimum age requirement for board members can ensure that they have sufficient life experience and judgment to make important decisions related to managing trust assets and making sure distributions to beneficiaries are done properly. You also might want to consider an education requirement. Requiring board members to have a certain level of education, such as a college degree or professional certification in finance or law, can ensure that they have the necessary knowledge and skills to effectively oversee the trusts or foundation's operations. If there's an education requirement, consider what types of education qualify. Does it need to be in something like business or law, or can it be anything? A degree in English, for example, likely won't provide much relevant knowledge. Will you require any professional experience? Requiring board members to have a certain amount of relevant professional experience, such as experience in wealth management, finance, law, or trust and foundation administration, can ensure that they have a deep understanding of the industry and are capable of making informed decisions. You want seasoned people on your board that know what they're doing and have a strong network to rely on for advice. You also might want to consider a background check requirement right? Conducting background checks on potential board members can help identify any potential conflicts of interest, criminal history, or other red flags that may compromise the integrity of the board of the trust or foundation. Some clients won't allow prospective board members with a criminal history to serve, for example, while others may limit only board members convicted of crimes of moral turpitude from serving. Likewise, being disciplined by a professional governing body could also disqualify people. Another less thought of requirement is a diversity requirement. Encouraging or requiring board members to come from diverse backgrounds can help ensure that the trust or foundation's decisions are made with a broad range of perspectives and experiences in mind. I'm not saying you need to go woke, but an all male board, for example, may not be able to fully understand the needs of female beneficiaries. Having females on the board would likely serve them better. Likewise, having all lawyers isn't a good idea either. You want people with diverse backgrounds and experience. For example, having family members, a trust professional, a lawyer, 
and a wealth manager give you many different perspectives that will likely benefit the board and the beneficiaries of the trust or foundation. Another good requirement to consider is a director training requirement. Will prospective board members need to have some sort of director training or certification or have experience serving on a board before? It's important for board members to understand their duties and responsibilities, as well as how boards function and what the purpose of a board is. I've seen too many examples of people serving on a board and not understanding what an annual general meeting is, for example, or what a resolution is, or when one is required. It's a hindrance to the board as a whole if someone doesn't know what they are doing. Also, is there gonna be a technology proficiency requirement? Requiring board members to have a certain level of proficiency with relevant technology, such as financial management software or communications tools, can help ensure that the board is equipped to effectively manage the trust or foundation in a modern digital environment. While this may not seem important, I've seen this cause some major issues. From not being able to use Zoom or sign documents electronically to not even knowing how to scan a document, this can cause havoc. While these next items aren't necessarily requirements to be able to serve on the board, it's also a good idea to have a conflict of interest disclosure requirement, for example, requiring board members to disclose any potential conflicts of interest, such as business or personal relationships with beneficiaries or vendors. This can help prevent any unethical behavior or decision-making that could compromise the trust or foundation's integrity. You don't want family members on the board, for example, teaming up with certain beneficiaries so that those beneficiaries get special treatment. You also may not want a lawyer on the board whose law firm represents the trust or foundation so they can try to maximize the billing for their firm. There should also be a succession planning requirement. So requiring the board to have a succession plan in place can ensure that the trust's or foundation's leadership transitions happen smoothly and effectively in the event of a board member's departure or retirement. Although you can leave this up to the board, I prefer to define how succession will work in the entity's governing document. I just think this is better and it takes any room for judgment out. It makes sure that you know how it's gonna happen, that it happens smoothly. Another good idea is to have an ethics training requirement. Requiring board members to participate in regular ethics training can help ensure that they are aware and adhere to the best practices and ethical standards for trust and foundation management. I think it is just a good practice to ensure board members get regular ethics training. It makes them aware of ethical responsibilities they may not have known about, and it keeps ethics at the forefront of their minds. There you have it, how your board should be composed and what criteria board members should have to meet in order to be able to serve. I hope you found this episode useful and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Thank you for joining me on Wealth Uncensored, where we help you minimize taxes and protect your wealth for the next generation. If you like our show, be sure to subscribe and leave a review. And if you have any questions or suggestions for future episodes, we'd love to hear from you. You can email us at info at esquiregroup.com. And don't forget to visit Esquire Group's website for more information on how we can help you secure your wealth. I'll be dropping knowledge again next week. Don't forget to join us.